From the John DeVita Broadcast Center, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another broadcast of Armchair Experts with Jim Leon and Rich Massaro on the Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network and Jack FM 89.7 WRHS FM Norwich on Wednesday, September the 2nd, the year of our Lord, 2015. And now, here they are, live, in person, and breathing on their own, Jim and Rich. Sitting up, taking nourishment. Jan I, sounds exceptionally peppy this he's, morning to he's me about for some his, reason. He, he's, got his, he's got his coffee and his Santa Claus cup. Wow. Is, he, he, is he all ready for that? Yeah. We, we turn to September, and Jan's looking forward to Christmas Jan's already. Jan's already looking for Christmas. I think this is... Uh, oh, Jan, you know what? Uh, since we always say, uh, you know, on our insistence that it's the year of our Lord, we know that you don't look at, at that as the holiday season. You still realize that, uh, like the, most of the rest of us who have our sanity, that it's Christmas. Right. Yeah, right. Christmas, That's definitely. Right. That's right. That's right. Hey, a couple of things here. I just happened to glance, and before we go off, I want to wish a happy birthday to one of our old classmates, Mike Carroll. Mike. Mikey Carroll, I think, is 60. He should be, I'm guessing, 64 today. Yeah, I think. And and just to make it even better, that yesterday Mike and his wife celebrated their fortieth wedding anniversary. Wow, that's I can't even. That's I can't, one brave woman. I can't even add. I can't even add all my marriages up and get to forty. <laughs> yeah, we know that, Jim. We're not gonna. We're, we're not gonna get into that subject. I hope. Jeez. Hey, Jeez. you know, good old Mike Carroll. Mike Carroll. I, you know, I still wonder, Jim. I wish you would have been involved with the football team our sophomore year because Mike Carroll ended up beating out uh, Bill Caravia for the starting center job. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the heck happened to Bill. You know how sometimes in high school, if you're lucky, you only drop off the map for a year. Mm -hmm. You know, some people drop off the map for the whole four years. For four years, years, yeah. But uh, Bill dropped off the map for a year, and then Bill bounced back. His senior year was an all-conference player. But Mike Carroll actually beat him out for that center spot uh, on our sophomore team. So Mike, Mike was a good wrestler, too, wasn't he? I don't as I re- remember. As I don't know. I, I think he was a good wrestler. Okay. From what I yes, yes, because when I ran into John Schmidt a while ago outside okay. of Mariano's, when he thought I was Mike Carroll. Oh, geez. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, Johnny Schmidt, very good wrestler. There. Yes. So he. That's right, because he brought it up then. Okay. He brought and, and talking about lengthy marriages. Yeah. I recently noticed that. Joe Nowak, Joe no- Nowak and his wife Lori celebrated their forty-third wedding anniversary. Uh, you know, they, obviously, they, we, there weren't all screw-ups in our class. Right? <laughs> 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 uh, not every, not everybody was just a complete screw-up. Yeah, some people have had some long marriages. Why? Wow, those are long. And the, 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 uh, I want to say, did Joe marry uh, Lori, Lori Carnicelli? Okay. And talking about Bill Cravey and his wife. They've been married a long time. Yeah, uh, Lisa, the Le- former Lisa, Lisa Schmidt. Schmidt. Yeah. Yeah. So that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, Bill and Lisa, and actually went together for, I don't I don't know, wouldn't say how many years, but they dated when they were in high school. Yeah. So. Yeah. And, well, uh, even uh, our, an, another classmate of ours, uh, Lori Bornhorst, who is now Lori Olbersch, Bill and Lori Olbersch mar- have got to be married for 40-some e- years. E- easily. Um, since I've seen things recently from um, uh, Mary Georgianis, who was one of our classmates, in regard to the Divine Savior uh, 50th uh, class reunion. Yeah, that's got to be coming up soon. It's coming it? up September 19th. Oh my gosh! Um, yeah. And oh, and good luck, good luck to them for that. That uh, that day, I was I sent um, uh, Mary a note on Facebook that I said I was really hoping I could crash the crash it that night and see some old friends i said but we're that's our football weekend up in michigan well where is that going to be that is going to be uh, the party is going to be at moretti's so Moretti's. okay so you need to go crash yeah i, I do i need to crash for sure you need to cr- i want to see those people no doubt about you that. need to, you need to crash for yeah. that one and uh i i know they're starting at four o'clock with a mass at uh, Divine Savior, and then tours of the school, and then the evening party at 
whatever time it starts. I don't, I don't recall. Well, for our massive radio audience, I do want to say that... Uh, and by the way, Mary's been married for at least... Got to be at least 30, 35 years. Wow. Uh, the, the voice... And I, I did, you know what, I did, tr- uh, your name did appear in the article that uh, the... They spell uh, it right? Yeah, they did, that okay. the uh, okay. Norwich News, uh, yeah, Norwich okay. Harwood Heights News was nice enough to run about me uh, okay. this past week. long as they spell I, my I, name I don't right. know if they actually said, you are the golden voice. They, they said, I was the golden voice, but you are actually the I voice am, of the, I am the gold, I Rebels am, uh, football I am the, and basketball and everything else. And, and, uh, uh, I'm your golden voice. But you're going to be replaced this weekend by a uh, worthy, be, worthy, <laughs> worthy uh, replacement. Tommy Lentine yeah. is going to Tommy Lentine come in and Tom help us out. Had a great, uh, uh, had a lot of fun doing a basketball game uh, with Tommy last year or the year before. Can't recall. It was the year before last year. Year before yeah. when you were on special assignment. And, the, and uh, Tommy's been and champing at the bit to to get back. I think. Oh, we had Tommy and I had a lot of fun because uh, with Ma- Tommy is the Montini AD, athletic director. And uh, I was going to say that uh, I told you prior to the broadcast, Montini <laughs> oh, is at, going to uh, East St. Louis. Look at this. Look at this BS. On Saturday. Look at this BS. Golden yeah, voice. Golden, <laughs> golden voice. <laughs> You're hearing it right now. The John, golden voice. John just handed me an article. Yeah, see? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so so now you know, <laughs> definitely don't believe everything you read in the papers. Oh, yeah. my God. The golden voice sounds like he's been hit gargling with glass. Yeah. <laughs> All right, yeah. let's, let's let's get to business here, my friend. <laughs> the two can be found huddled in the press box. <laughs> That's it, huddled, and we are huddled. The way that press you're, box is set you're up, you're huddled, huddled masses sure. yearning to breathe free. <laughs> so what have we got today, Mister? I don't Van? know. You know what? I I just opened this up. It it I just flipped open this gate. page yeah, and this deflate gate, and and I got to think. I, I know from some things I've read and heard that the uh, U.S. District Judge keeps looking at uh, Richard Berman, keeps looking at Tom Brady and Roger Goodell every time he comes in, every time they come in front of him on this on this matter with a look like, what are you two, two, what are you two clowns doing in here in front of me? You know, why I, are you wasting, why are you wasting my time on this? It sounds to me, though, that... Uh, at least that article, the one that you have in front of you, indicates that Berman uh, is not going to look at this in a narrow uh, in a narrow point of view. That, that according to the CBA, you know, Goodell can make decisions based on what's good for the game. Right. I think uh, they they indicate in the in the article there that he's going to take a broader look at this thing, and uh, which which could spell trouble for Goodell and the NFL at least in this case. And you know the thing I didn't realize up until maybe a month ago is there are no actual rules regarding the um, the football. Uh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Then why I mean, why do we, why are we talking about that? I you know what because I apparently if that's the case that the uh, the commissioner Goodell is is probably overstepped his bounds a little bit. Well, but I, I still it, say this. I'm not a big conspiracy guy, but Jim, this is what I've in the back of my mind, I haven't said this to many people, and I don't know if I've said this to you on the air, but I may have said this to you over coffee. I'm thinking that the Patriots are are, are ruining the NFL's plan of parity by having been, you know, what the Patriots have been towards the top of the league now for, what, 10, 15 years, would you say? At least. 10 no. years at least, let's at say. At least. And I, I'm not sure that the league likes that. And this may be their way of trying to cut the Patriots down uh, to to uh, come back to the pack a little bit. Well, that that that's very possible. And if that's the case, Roger Goodell better be watching uh, any time uh, uh, Robert Kraft is around him. I, I have to ask you this because uh, that that was that, a, that was true. a good buddy. That was a buddy. Uh, I, let me ask you this: uh, the the other issue with football that's come up uh, again is the talk of cutting the exhibition season down to two games from four. I, uh, what, what are your thoughts about that? Well, you remember when we were kids and it was six. It was six, yeah. Yeah. It was a- six. And I, and I, and I wonder, uh, you know, I, I wonder if that's the case. How are they going to, ad- how are they going to adjust rosters at that point? I, I see. I agree. I, I think there's... You know, you might, you might cut it but you may have to have some flexibility with your rosters 
for yeah. those first two games, and maybe it's by the third game of the season you have to be down to 53. Uh, well, there's a couple things. I think that's a great point. The other thing is I, I really like the idea of at least four games because I think everybody gets a fair shot to be looked at. Right, uh, where, right. Where you, where, right. And that right. really that really sort of coincides with what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, there are definitely people on probably all of these teams where the the difference between a guy making a team and that is razor thin and and they that person needs as much chance to show themselves as they possibly can get and two games in my opinion is is not enough what do no, you I, mean, I, really. I don't think two games is enough either now the big the big there, argument there against the be... four games is all of the injuries that uh, are happening well yeah but you know what I I, I feel like this when you're um, when you're playing exhibition games obviously you're going to have the chance of that happening but your your starters are not going to be in there exclusively whereas if you expanded the season by another two games and now everybody's going at it full bore you're going to get you know maybe the same guys won't get injured but you're going to get more injuries anyway there's going to be yeah there's still going to be a lot of injuries right uh it's not you know you're right it's not going to be the same guys it, it's uh and and so many people that have been lost this season. Yeah, that, I mean, I looked at today that the Steelers uh, they lost a wide receiver, I think, for the. Uh, I don't know is he uh, they have suspended lost because of uh, of some other reason or is he injured? Well, I, I'm. Um, but they they lost uh, Pouncey for a while. They're they lost. Uh, okay, I'm just looking at the Steelers today in the uh, uh, transaction list. Offensive tackle Mike, Mike Adams is on the pup list, physically unable to perform. Mm -hmm. uh, defensive back Sequez Goldston and place kicker Garrett Hartley are on the injured reserve list. Right. You know. All right. And somebody else lost a kicker. Uh, yeah, uh, I want to say that might have been the Buccaneers. They Buccaneers. just traded for a kicker. Uh, Maybe that was it. Somebody lost a yeah. lost a kicker for the season. Yeah, they just traded a tight end uh, to uh, Detroit for uh, a pick kicker by the name of Kyle Brinza. So I'm assuming that uh, maybe the Bucks lost a place kicker. Yeah. And I noticed that uh, Josh Scobie, who was a longtime kicker in the league, was just uh, released by, I uh, can't remember which team he was with, but, uh, yeah, there, there even seems to be some injury problems or some age-related problems with some of the kickers in the league because there's been uh, a, a little bit of movement among the place kickers uh, prior to the season happening, yeah. and there'll probably be some more because we've got one, what have we got, uh, one more week of exhibitions? One more week of exhibitions, and this the fourth one is usually a kind of a useless game. Now, my, my personal feeling on the exhibitions as well is I think that, tends to be the more entertaining football at least from my point of view because i i really you know i think we've talked about this quite a bit maybe just between you and i and not in the air but i've said take all the eyes in the sky out of the press box get them on the sidelines take those guys out of it get a lot of the technology out of the game get more mistakes into the game again and you'll see a more entertaining game uh, that's that's what I believe. I mean, I, I you know I know coaches hate mistakes. If I was coaching, I would hate mistakes, interceptions, or blown coverages, or whatever. But I think that's also what makes the game a little more entertaining. The game is so cookie cutter. Oh yeah. Uh, these days, that it it becomes less and less entertaining every year. Yeah. Were you surprised at uh, uh, Tim Jennings being released? Uh, I was Not actually sort of glad in a, a way. I, 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 I've. I've I've said for a long time, I, I think they overpaid him. Yeah. Uh, and um, I, I, and I'm I not saying he's not a good player. No, he, still, he he's, still might have a, he still might have some time. Yeah. Uh, but the fact that uh, uh, he was like the sixth cornerback out there the other night. Yeah. yeah. He was like out in the last group. Yeah. That, that, that know, was and, a big indicator. And he knew it then, too. Yeah. And, and he knew it, too. I, he had some class, though. Did you see his uh, comments in the paper yeah. yesterday? Yeah. Uh, moving forward, you yeah. know, wish the Bears yeah. well. He just acknowledged the fact that, hey, these things happen. Yeah, uh, you know, you're, and, he's uh, a, you're a veteran. You yeah. understand that. So uh, they determined it yesterday. They caught uh, Tim Jennings and Daniel Thomas. Ryan Mundy is on injured reserve. So does that mean he's done for the year? 
Uh, I there think is the two uh, list. There's, there's, there's the, two different uh, injured reserves. There's the injured reserve, reserve that's done for the year, an injured reserve. You come back after eight weeks. I think Mundy's is the one where I think he's the guy who's on the uh, all-year injured reserve because okay. I think they indicated yesterday that uh, he was under a two-year deal and he's likely seen his last snap with the Bears. Okay, so. okay. Uh, and uh, uh, the rookie, Kevin White, is on the reserve pup list. They have so many lists. I don't. Think I, I, can I can't even keep, keep track. It's them. like baseball now. Yeah, you have got the uh, you know. Jim, do you remember in baseball when a, a player had X number of options? Yeah, it used and to be they, like three uh, options. You know, I think he had three up? options. But guys, uh, Mike Caesar. Uh, uh, is been, it Mike Caesar? Uh, Matt. His, Matt Caesar. Matt. That guy. He's I mean, been up and down. Put it like this way: if they were going under the old rules, he would have been out of options uh, about halfway through the season. Yeah. I think. Yeah, you know the other. And there's guys. Thing? There's guys who get optioned by the time they get out. You know, by the time they get in their car and they're uh, you know 25 miles away, well, they've been recalled. Have you seen what uh, what's been going on in New York for most of the season with Chris Capuano? No. Oh my gosh, that guy has been on a yo-yo string the whole the whole really? year. Yeah, I mean, and they've been, you know, uh, sending them to uh, I think it's Scranton. And then bringing them back, or to release them, and then they re-sign them. They they've been going through so many shenanigans, and the whole thing is, uh, the Yankees have basically, I guess, got so many good arms in their system that they've just been watching what the guy say the guy pitches uh, today at Scranton, and then they want him to come up to the big club for uh, say the Labor Day weekend, so they'll bring him up for that. They'll have them with the team for, say, a period of time. Then they send them back to uh, to the minors. But, they, I, I mean, it's been a revolving door with the Yankees. They named, uh, I don't know how many different guys, about a half a dozen different guys that have been up, down. But, Chris, if you, uh, you want to see something interesting for the viewing audience, because I can't go through the whole scenario, but uh, type in Chris Capuano's name. And just see what his see season many, has been like. See how many times uh, he's uh, yeah. Yes. Go to the base. Go go to baseballreference dot com. Yeah. yeah and, you, and look you will, it up, you'll and you'll see, see a very interesting season. You'll see him up and down. Yes. Um, what do you think of uh, uh, the the Illini, uh firing that boob Tim Beckman? Uh, you know, I I guess that uh, boy, I, I'll tell you the timing of it is interesting. And uh, I'm I'm wondering if they're running scared or if uh, you know they they've really done an investigation and found abuse or a combination of the two. Because uh, you know I it, the timing of the whole thing is really weird. It it you know a week before a week before your opener. Yeah. Yeah, and they are. 14 and a half point favorites over Penn State, if anybody cares to go to the window. They are favorites over Penn State? Yes, 14 and a half points. Oh, my gosh. Now, you know, the interesting thing is I, I hate with the, with Not the, that we're the encouraging reporters. Betting. The reporters always paint with such a, uh, a broad brush. And uh, Cubit, is it Bill Cubit? Bill Cubit. And obviously he was the, uh, the one person on the staff that they felt was most capable to step in, and I think it was probably the right move. But, you know, they're saying now, the Illini are saying that Cubit is a possible uh, long-term successor. At least he'll be considered when they they uh, look for their next coach. And, you know, the, the at least the papers, uh, paper guy, newspaper guys I read were saying, uh, you know, uh, he's tainted by the fact he was on Beckman's staff. You know, I, I, these guys are they they are they paint with such a broad brush. It's, course, it's unbelievable. Of course, I mean the you know the comment was uh, uh, I, I think the comment was based on the fact that Cuban, when he was asked about this, goes, "Well, I don't know anything about this. So I never saw any of that." Well, you know, he may not. He may not. He but, may not. I you know there. Are, uh, let me tell you, Jim. There are some guys who come to work. They do their job, they leave, and they don't want to get involved in all the other stuff that goes with every team. And those guys, I think, I I like what they do to a certain extent. But then there's other guys who are wrapped up in everything. And you, you find both types on coaching staffs, among the, the, the team. 
And, uh, you know, I, I don't think there's a right or wrong of it, but some people just say, hey, I'm going to do my job. I'm going to coach. I'm going to go to my uh, staff meetings after practice. And then I'm just going to go home and all of this outside noise that accompanies any team, uh, I'm not going to be involved in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when Cubit says that, I, I could buy that unless mm -hmm. I know something absolutely different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Well, it'll be inter it'll be interesting. I mean, football kicks off Thursday night. College football kicks off Thursday night. Uh, looks like ten big games of the of the bigger players uh, on Thursday night. Uh, what would, what might be the most interesting game? Utah and Michigan. Michigan travels to Utah. Jim Harbaugh's first co uh, uh, first uh, game co as the head coach of his alma mater. Hmm. And they're coming in. Uh, they're going into Utah at five and a half point underdogs. Well, you you still have me scratching my head. How how could Penn? St I thought Penn State had a decent team last year. How could they be that bad? But to be fourteen and a half point dogs to the Illini. Kent State. Oh, Kent State. I thought you said Penn no, State. No, no. Okay, Kent State. Fourteen and a half. Okay, fourteen and a half point dogs. Matter of fact, now that you mention Penn State. Saturday they are playing at Temple. Okay, is Temple Temple's not in the Big Ten? Rutgers? No, is, right? Rutgers is. Okay. Rutgers is. Temp then uh, uh, Penn State is a seven-point favorite over Temple. Over Temple at uh, Temple at Temple. Okay. So I have no idea what Temple is unless I have no idea either. Unless they've resurrected Bill Cosby <laughs> as a player, because we know he was a he was actually a he was a running player. back. He was a good running back. I think he actually back, had a he? tryout with the uh, Giants yeah, after I think so. he was at Temple, so I he think must so. have been decent. Michigan State kicks off Friday night against Western Michigan. Boy, Eight. that should be a route. Eighteen and a half point favorites. I noticed. Uh, It'll be interesting. the 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 following week will be the first good test to see what uh, um, give a good test to see what Michigan State's like because uh, um, Oregon comes in. All right. Did you see that uh, the, one of the guys who's pressing hard for a uh, start or a, a position in the defensive backfield with the Bears, uh, Terrence Mitchell is an Oregon guy. Yeah. And uh, yeah. you know, I, I'm always interested to see when a guy gets picked up. Uh, by okay, Mitchell was with the Cowboys, I guess, last year, and thought he was going to make the team. And I, I guess he said he was on his way from practice home. And he gets a call on his cell phone, it was the Cowboys, tell him that, that he didn't make the team. So the Bears picked him up, and he was on the practice squad. But I find it interesting that he was teammates with Kyle Long. And you always wonder, uh, I'm not saying that, say, uh, uh, in this case I'm using the name Kyle Long, but I'm sure that the Bears, uh, whoever was running things for the Bears, probably said to, you know, they, they probably took Kyle Long on the side and said, hey, listen, you're a teammate of this guy. Uh, you know, can you tell me something about him? And and probably based on, uh, not totally on what Kyle Long said, but probably a little bit on uh, with Kyle Long's input, I'm sure that's how a guy like uh, a Mitchell got to be with the Bears. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that happens quite frequently in Major League Baseball, football, whatever. Um some people, you'll hear them talk about things like that. They find it objectionable, but I just find it uh, that's the way most people do business. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I thought, uh, uh, and I know uh, my wife was uh, quite happy when I uh, saw the item come across uh, yesterday. That what, that Cousins is going to start? That her Redskins. guy, <laughs> her guy. Now, is, is Hoyer a Michigan State guy, too? Yeah. Because he's going to start yeah. for uh, yeah. who, the Texans? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. But she was quite happy when I told her her guy is going to be the starter in Washington. Now, I'm, I'm watching, I'm watching uh, the way the Bears are going to be this year because, uh, you know, you get there's some halfway decent quarterbacks that are going to be around in the draft this coming season, after this season. Are there? Yeah, I think so. You're going to have, you're going to have a couple of them. I'm looking at... Uh, well, though, uh, I'm looking you, at. You mean uh, you're going to say that Jay Cutler is not going to tear it up with a patchwork offensive line and no, <laughs> and no wide receivers? And no, or wide, you and no think, wide receivers. You don't think he's going to look too good that way? <laughs> Are you? I, I I watched the first two games and I thought, 
these guys aren't that bad. Yeah. And then I watched the third game. And I went, mm, yeah, these guys are that bad. Well, let but me he's got nobody. He's got nobody to throw the ball to. Uh, <laughs> you know, another thing that I guess all of a sudden has become, uh, geez, a rule of thumb that I never realized was a rule of thumb before was that third exhibition game. That's the portent of what your season is going to be like, according oh to. Uh, my you know, oh my gosh! Oh my! Can you so look Oy, out? We're in rule trouble, boy! Is hey, <laughs> beware of the mighty third exhibition game of the se- preseason. Yes, that's always well. We're going to let the starters play into the third quarter, and yeah, we'll see what they look like, and they look terrible. <laughs> yeah, he's got I, no. He's got no receivers. Good yeah. Lord. Well, they, now they're saying, I guess Wilson and Royal, I think, uh, at least participated in practice. Jeffrey didn't even make the trip with the team to yeah. Cincinnati. Yeah. Uh, but you know what? I, if if we get a couple of those guys back, it should look better. Uh, and did you see that, uh, speaking of quarterbacks and receivers, did you see that the uh, Patriots signed Reggie Wayne? Yes, I saw that. Yeah. So... I, I don't think Bill Belichick is going to worry about the fact that Reggie Wayne is, what, 33 or 34? Because, you know, when Tom Brady quarterbacks, and uh, we were talking about this over coffee this morning, uh, you know, Brady, what I like about a guy like Brady, you know, and we're, and we're talking about the Bears, but I, we're talking quarterbacks, is re- I'll tell you, I don't care who the the receiver is. There is a time in a receiver's route when he's open because defensive backs – no matter how good they are at coverage, it's not like you can throw a blanket over a guy. And Brady is so successful because he's expert at seeing that moment in time when uh, that guy is open and delivering the ball at that instant. And uh, that's that's the trick. So when you see that, you know, okay, Reggie Wayne, my, he's past his prime. He's an old guy. You know what? Reggie Wayne will, will do fine. As long as Brady is the quarterback, mm-hmm. and almost any receiver any, will do fine any, with any, Brady as the quarterback. Anybody will do fine because he knows when you're open. That's right. That's right. Just going back to uh, the Illini, here was an interesting little clip. Here, uh, the U.S. government claims that Chinese hackers stole the personal information of 21 million Americans when they breached the Office of Personnel Management databases last year. That's in addition to alleged Chinese attacks against corporate, military, and research computer systems in the United States. Last week, the University of Illinois announced it would edge edge Chinese language broadcasts of its football games this season. The Illini have gone 12-25 and over the past three seasons under former coach Tim Beckman. I believe that's called a commensurate response. Ah, okay. (laughs) I think. Okay. We'll get even with them. We'll them We'll make them listen to Illini football. What are you up to in there, Dr. DeVita? What are you doing? Paperwork. 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 He's doing doing paperwork during our mo- uh, fascinating uh, uh, broadcast. Our fascinating or? broadcast, and you're sitting there shuffling paper? Hey, by the way, what did you think about, uh, you know, Derek Rose is now has his problems with somebody uh, claiming I, I think some there's, sexual uh, harassment I, I, I or think whatever? There's, I think there's something in the water at the United Center. There, <laughs> there must be. I, I'm not sure. I think there's something in the water at the United Center that's causing this. Now, the big question that's going to be, and maybe we'll talk a little bit about that, is what are the what are the Hawks going to do? Because training camp's going to open well, in a couple of weeks. They're just going to go to training camp because I don't think any, uh, to be honest with you, I, I think the way the, they're investigating this thing in uh, upstate New York, uh, if there was, I, I got to say, if there was anything there really was, there, I think it would be been a ch- there'd have been a ch- about already. There would be a charge and something going on, and the yeah. fact that this has been going on so long, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I don't, I don't know what they're doing. Yeah, well, the, they're carefully looking at it, but, uh, but obviously, there's nothing that jumps right out at you because uh, if there was, uh, again, there would be some action taken. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I th- I think this whole thing is sort of seems sort of shaky to me. And I I, I would say the same thing. I, I think Derek Rose has taken a uh, a wrong turn someplace in terms of his attitude about basketball. But I, I I don't think I would go so far as to say 
that he's stupid enough to uh, have uh, gotten into the situation well, that they say that he's supposedly in. And, and the fact that that uh, uh, with Rose you're dealing with a civil suit. Yeah. Um, you're dealing with a civil case. Um, uh, Keynes right now is is a criminal. Mm-hmm. Is is a criminal investigation. And you know what I mean? Uh, you know, there's been so many stories about that. Somebody, uh, you know, somewhere along the way, somebody said both sides would like to make this go away for about a million dollars. Uh, on which one? Uh, on the uh, uh, Kane situation. Yeah, because yeah. neither neither side really wants this to come to court. Aha! Uh-huh. So well, I could believe but that's, that. But that's that's you know what well, that's just the, the 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 stories that fly and and there's been so much flying we don't know what it's true what's true or not dr davida it's getting near the bottom of the hour would you like to break the station or at least put it back together after we broke it okay. all right <laughs> okay let's do it okay okay <laughs> man he's really uh, tied up in that paperwork You are listening to Armchair Experts from the John DeVita Broadcast Center on Jack FM 89.7 WRHS FM Norwich and the Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network on Wednesday, September the 2nd, the year of our Lord, 2015, with Jim Leon and Rich Massaro. And this is Jack FM 89.7 WRHS FM Norwich. And now, back to Armchair Experts with Jim Leon and Rich Massaro. I, I love this guy, John DeVita. Yeah, I know. You know, he is, I uh, know. He is a, a, a good man. And I, you know what? I, I think I already said this on the air, but at your wedding, man, that this dude was sharp. He cleaned up. He cleans up pretty well. In fact, we all, you. in fact, we all cleaned up pretty well. Yeah, no doubt about it. Hi, Allie. We you know, I'll, I'll, t- I'll tell you guys something. You know, I, as you well know, I'm involved with the Chicago Fire Department. And when I was president of the 511 Club years ago, I used to go to all the retirement parties or, or all these different uh, doings outside the firehouse. And I would always go dressed up. And, of course, all the firemen would be dressed up. And, you know, you're with these guys all the time when they're in their fire uniform. But when they're all dressed up, you forget what who they are and what their names are. Yeah, yeah, I could believe that, Jen. You know, I yeah. mean, you see this guy, you know. You're used second. to seeing him one way, and yeah. then there you see him dressed up, and it's e- like exactly. it throws you off for a second. Right. No yeah. doubt about it. Yeah. Hey, Jim, did you, I think I, I mentioned this to you right before the broadcast, but the, in um, in some of the, I guess in the fact that the, uh, the Cubs traded for Austin Jackson, uh, they released Mike Olt from the uh, 40-man roster. So I guess he's still in the organization, but off the 40-man roster. And uh, it made me think it's a, it's a shame. To me, it's a shame when you see that happen because Mike Olt at one time was a very strong prospect. He had some, uh, he had some injury eye, problems he had that I don't eye, know that he ever totally got over. Uh, he had an eye injury. Um, and the, the, year before they, uh, the year before the Cubs picked him up, and uh, I, I'm not sure if he's ever really come back from that. You know, I root for guys like that oh, because yeah. I'd like to yeah. see them a, it yeah. all work out for them. I remember yeah. years ago watching a uh, a Cubs broadcast when uh, Harry Carey was still alive and doing the games, and the Cubs were playing the Phillies, and a guy came in uh, in relief for the Phillies, a left-handed pitcher whose name I, I don't remember, and Harry started to, uh, you know, sort of philosophize, and he said, you know, he said, people complain about all of these guys and the big salaries they make, but how many uh, guys, and he, this guy who was pitching, he named as one, uh, and I guess the guy had been a top prospect and had had some arm problems. He goes, how many guys are there around that are like this, that had promising starts to their careers and then injuries ended them or, you know, whatever? Mm-hmm. And I think he's right. I, I, I bet you the ratio is huge on the side of the guys who – had promising careers and didn't make it versus the ones who actually did. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, I always mm-hmm. uh, feel for those guys who didn't because, yeah. uh, hey, yeah. you know, we all missed out. By if, if you had a great talent that uh, didn't pan out, how about a guy like Pete Reeser, uh, Jim? 
They ran said, in, you know, ran into the wall. They didn't too expect many times. You know. They didn't even expect him to live after one of yeah. those. You know. So yeah. and uh, Mike, Michael was uh, DFA designated for assignment. Designated, which which means which that he's, he's uh, probably going to be back with Iowa, because they uh, they just brought up uh, I think four guys for sure. Baez, they brought up Barry, they uh, brought up Javi Baez, Quentin Berry, Trevor Cahill. And Siyoshi Wada. Now, do you know Trevor now the Cahill, is he a pitcher or is he a position player? I don't know what he is. I'm gonna guess he's a pitcher. I don't know. I I think he might be. Um, now the the deal with Jackson is uh, they picked up Austin Jackson and Cash from the Mariners for an international signing bonus slot, which was a couple of hundred thousand dollars, mm-hmm. and a player to be named later. That's not a bad deal. No, I mean uh, Austin Jackson was hitting two seventy two seventy two homers, thirty eight RBIs, fifteen stolen bases. So I, 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 and I personally, I sort of like Austin Jackson. I think he brings at least defensively. I think he's going to be solid, and you know he can provide a little offense for you. He's got some pop. He can steal a base here or there, and uh, so I think uh, hey, the trade is worth it. I think it was. I think it was a great deal when I saw that. That's and I really, although I have to say, I always hate to see when those international signing bonuses. I know. Go I know. Buffalo, I know. You. You get. I know. You get I very get all emotional up about that. You get very emotional when you think, "Oh my God, another international signing bonus disappeared. Who are they going to get? Who are they going to be able to find from there?" Really, you that's know. no doubt about it. Uh, it was kind of interesting to see the Yankees put a waiver claim in on David Robertson. Yeah, I mean, and they, the Sox, uh, Sox pulled them back. Yeah, I, they. Although, I don't know. It's not really unusual for guys to be put on waivers. No, ever. No. So no, especially I mean, if if your team is out of it. Right. If your team is out of it, they put everybody up there. And if you if you read, uh, I don't know which article it is, but I guess it's that one uh, about Robertson being put on waivers. If you read further. Uh, since Nate Jones has come back and looked good, uh, I think maybe the Sox thought process was, you know, a, it's the last day we can do this or the last week when we can do it. Let's put them out there. If anything interesting happens. If, if we get a deal, you know, that's fine. Uh, it's good. And uh, if, if, if it's something does happen, uh, Jones looks pretty good. He may be our closer of the future anyway. Yeah. So I, I, the other, But, you know, the thing that really interests me, if you read that article, Jim, Nate Jones has been back long enough to pitch just a little over nine innings. He's uh, struck out like 15, 15 guys. Allowed uh, two walks. And so he's looked good for nine innings. Oh, but the man is coming off a critical surgery. Yeah. So now you're telling me, and if this is the Sox thinking, shame on them. Or, and, and you know what? It's not just the Sox. You could probably say this of any team in baseball uh, or any team in sports. Uh, because of expansion, the quality players have become so thinned out that teams actually think like this, where you could take a guy coming off a major injury who looks good for whatever Jones has been back. Uh, let's say it's a month. I don't even think it's been that. Now you're going to take a guy that you, you invested 40 some million in and put him on waivers, possibly trade him, and plug in this guy that's been out for a year as his successor. I mean... That, but that thinking is not just uh, limited to the Sox. It's, it's prevalent it, throughout uh, yeah. all professional sports. Yeah. And it's stupid. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you talk, you know, you hear the thing, okay, he's he's done well in nine and a nine and two-thirds innings. <laughs> and two-thirds. That is not exactly what you would call a big sample size. No, it's not. You know. Not at all. To, to be able to effectively... Decide if a player is going to be if is is a if a player is going to be worth it. No, no, no. no that's for sure. Now, what did what did you think, Jim? Uh, speaking of the Sox, what uh, again about a week or so ago, the rumors of uh, Kenny Williams maybe going to uh, Toronto or I think the other one was either Seattle or See, Cleveland or something. The Seattle job is open now. Toronto uh, is open. Toronto though just got filled because oh, Mark, Mark yeah. Shapiro went Shapiro. to uh, Toronto. Yeah. But, I mean, Kenny Williams has steadfastly said, this is all paper talk. I have no intention of going anywhere. Yeah. And it looks like he's the one who's on the side of, let's say, truth. Because, And I don't know where the papers dig the th- or they make them up or they, they dig them up. They or sit some- there and look and say, oh, he would be a great fit. Right, right. He would be a great fit. 
Yeah. And and well, I mean, Williams made a very honest, logical comment. He said, "Nobody's talked to me." Right. Because the first person they have to talk to is the big guy upstairs. Uh, that's right. They got to talk to uh, Reinstar first. They so. got to get permission from him to talk to me. Right. Right. He so. says, N- "Nobody's talked to me." Right. So that yeah, that's that's you know, but well, it it's uh. It's craziness, and yeah, you know what? The, I'll say this, though. I don't know if these people who write for the papers anymore are full-time people or they're part-time people, uh, but I, I'll give them a little bit of a pass in the sense if you don't know what the whole situation is and you need to write an article, like I'll look at the, you know, the Bears, the Cubs, and the Sox, are all featured in in the, the paper you're looking at today, and they all ha- have their little uh, notes section, right? You know, where you have uh, two or three paragraph or one paragraph right. deals. So I'm assuming the writer has got to fill space, mm-hmm. and he needs he or she needs to say something, mm-hmm. and it doesn't always necessarily mean that what they're saying is a fact. Yeah. Now, I, I, I don't know that that necessarily says anything bad about the reporter other than the fact, hey, you got a certain amount of space to fill, and you need to fill it. Yeah, yeah. So desperation may come into play here at times. Yeah, it was kind of funny. A, a good friend of mine, Dave Southwell, uh, used to write for the Sun-Times. Okay. And he, uh, he left, and he taught English for a while, and I happened to glance one day at his facebook page and he says and i see it and it looked like the present tense works for chicago sun times Mm -hmm. and i immediately emailed him i said are you back with the times and the response was i said are you back writing for the times and he went oh god no he said the only writing i do is for myself okay (laughs) okay i i'm not getting into that again no, I, I, you know, I think that's probably. Th- did you notice, Jim? The other thing that I thought was interesting, and I'm talking about newspaper-wise, when the Cubs went to the coast uh, last week, most of the time, if the game ends late, you don't see any game article. It'll be another article that they use to fill, and then you have to go to the website to get a uh, a box score or, or a final. But last week, at, at least starting out their trip. The, the, they had the game summary, they had the box score, at least for the Giants series. And I'm wondering if, because it was an important trip, that the paper decided to oh, go to press oh, later. I, th- I think they did. I, yeah. I, I think they did. Yeah. Uh, I think they held, they held this because I think in, the, in this day and age, I mean, who, who cares about the early edition? Yeah, that's and true. who who even buys it? I mean, in these days of shrinking subscription bases, yeah, yeah, and purchase bases, a lot of people are looking online. I mean, I have to tell you, you know, talk about how funny it was Sunday night with Arietta's no hitter. We're having our annual family outing with all the cousins, and we're at Ravinia for Carlos Santana. Oh, okay. And the six of us are there, uh, you know cousins and wives and we're all sitting there and i had to laugh at one point in time the girls are all sitting together and everybody's got their phone out and taking pictures and you know putting up on facebook we're on the other side looking and i'm following i'm following the no hitter on on yahoo pitch by pitch (laughs) uh yeah (laughs) you know that's nice (laughs) yeah Yeah, that's nice (laughs) I'm 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 doing a pitch by pitch follow up for Rich and Billy while we're sitting there going, oh, here he has got no hitter going. Ooh, good, getting another cl- and out closer. <laughs> well, I t- I tell you, I I didn't I don't read his article, but Dan Mc- McGrath said of all uh, Cubs no hitters that Arietta's was the the best or the most impressive or whatever. Uh, but I have to say, I was at uh, Laser Nights on Sunday night watching the end of the game, and. You know, I wasn't paying that close attention. I knew he had a no-hitter going, but I watched that last inning, and I'll tell you, his stuff, to me anyway, sitting there watching the game, looked like he was lights out that last inning. He was unbelievable. Man. Man. Talk about a guy, too. You know, Talk about a guy who was like, uh, well, I love the way uh, 
uh, the Swope article included himself in the uh, uh, you know how how great we're pitching. Uh, yeah, but I there. love I love this uh, uh, the article from uh, about uh, um, you know the deal giving him a fresh start, being referred to as nothing more than a lottery ticket. Yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah. You Al- know, although I think we panned the trade when it happened too, or at least I did. Yeah. I'll, I'll fest to that and look at. Although you know, I I have to say something happened and I'll, I'll uh, uh, if you read that article uh, you got to give Chris Bazio some real uh, points because he's the guy who uh, I guess talked to Epstein not talked him into it but said at least the Arietta part of it and it could probably be strobe too but Arietta is the the main focus of the article he said you know this guy is is probably worth having and looking at but it- something happened with Arietta between the time the Cubs got him and now, where his game just uh, it, it, it really improved. It was it it was interesting, and and his was the deal for him, and some references made to it was the first time I ever heard. And I know how much you love analytics for baseball. Oh yes, I love. But them. FIP fielding independent pitching, mm-hmm. in other words, what he can control. Right, and. His his FIP was much lower than what his earned run average was. Okay, which gave you an idea that a lot of his problems when he was with Baltimore didn't have to do with him. Okay, necessarily. Uh, the interesting and and it was kind of a predictor to what his earned run average was going to be the following year, mm-hmm. and it was true. Okay. But to the point now where what is he seventeen and six? Oh yeah, he's just uh, his, and his and, stuff and, is and, and his stuff is amazing. You know they used to talk about Samarja's stuff, uh, but I don't think there's a, a comparison. And you know here's the here you know what I keep reading. I don't I don't know if these these guys who write sports actually look at what's happening in the games, but I believe that when the 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 Sox. They traded for Samarja, I believe. Yeah, they yes, traded they Semien, wasn't it? Right. Uh, Marcus Marcus Semien. Okay. Uh, so uh, at least the comments that we had on that trade was because I made it a point to look up Samarja's record because the papers were making such a big deal out of, you know, you had Sale and Samarja. Well, the comment that I made on the air was that he's less than 500 pitcher life. Yeah, yeah. I don't believe if he if he won ten games, it might have been one year out of the. And I mean, Samarj is thirty years old now, so it's not like he's you know only been around a little while. He's been around a while, so he's never won ten games. Now everybody's shaking their heads that he's eight and eleven with a four point something ERA, and I'm like, why are they so uh, yeah, what, confused? What's, this what's is the big track surprise? Record. This is I, I I liken this back to. Um, um, when every when years ago and b- before the '83 season, when the uh, White Sox picked up Floyd Bannister, yeah, there you go. The good, I, that's a good I comparison. Said, I said, "What's the big deal about Floyd Bannister? Mm-hmm. He's an he's under 500, um, and you know, and and I kind of look at uh, Jeff Jeff Samarge's sat, stats. All right, let's check the old baseball reference dot com. Okay. Yep. Let's check. All right. His his uh, his lifetime, his career, his career uh, record. He's forty four and fifty. He's forty four and fifty nine. Okay. Four. Okay. He's forty four and fifty nine. Thank you, kind sir. You're a gentleman and a scholar, and I take back most every bad thing I've said about you. <laughs> most of it. <laughs> <laughs> um. 44 and 59. All right. Last year he was 7 and 13 between the Cubs and the A's. Right. You are correct. He has never won more. He has never won 10 games in a season. Yeah. In a season. He was in 12, he was 9 and 13 with the Cubs and 13, he was 8 and 13 granted. Bad ball clubs. Sure. You know. Um yeah, eight and thirteen, and then last year between he was, he was two and seven with the Cubs and five. He was two and seven with a bad ball club and a two point eight three earned run average. I'll say this though, Jim, and and uh, and your point is a good one. But think about uh, think of names like uh, K 
Cal Kuntz, yeah, or Glenn Hobby, yeah, or Bob Anderson, who guys who had double-digit winning seasons. Now they may have been under 500, but at least they won double digits with with poor clubs. So, it, I, I, and you know what? I'm not going to say that the guy didn't maybe pitch at times and some bad luck. But here's the thing: uh, that 44 and 59 is over how many years was it? Do you recall? I closed. I closed it. No. But uh, let's say it's uh, yeah, say it's same. six years. He you know. came up his first year in the majors. You know, part of that, you know, he was a relief pitcher. His first year in the majors was 2008. He was one and zero in 26 ball games. In 2009, he was one and three in 20 ball games with a 7.53 earned run average. Mm-hmm. In 10, he was two and two with an 8.38 earned run average. Okay, in 11, he was eight and four. He pitched in 75 ball games with a 2.97 ERA. Okay. Uh, and then we talked about the rest. This is a guy, you know, this is a guy who, who, oh, he's got promise. He's got promise. Well, he's 30 years old. Yeah, he is. I, you know, the thing, too, is, and I think this is a double-edged sword because it's not all on the player, but the, the thing that I uh, find interesting is, okay, you're with a bad team, so you don't learn how to, say, close out the deal. Right. But that sort of follows you, and now you're 30 years old, and maybe, well, and now the Sox aren't a good team this year either, but they was with Oakland that, at the end of last year, and that was a good team. Uh, you haven't learned to close the deal out, and when you get to 29 or 30 years old, the reality is you may never learn to do that. So he may be a guy with really good stuff, that really never becomes a complete pitcher in the sense of being able to really close a team out. And I think that's maybe the problem that Jeff Samarja... And you know what? I'm not an anti-Samarja guy. I mean, I sort of like Jeff Samarja. But I, I think the reality is, uh, again, why are the papers so mystified by the fact that he's under 500 because he's not been over 500 ever this has been this has been the level of his career and uh yeah you know yeah oh but you know some pitchers mature later well that may have been true years ago yeah may have been true years ago you know that that Maybe it took some of them a little longer where it had to be beat into their heads that how you need to pace yourself. Back in the days of four starters. Yeah, yeah. And guys pitching deep into a ball game. Yes, yeah. You know, maybe it took a little longer for some guys to get it beat into their head. Yeah. That this is what I've got to do to become a successful starting pitcher. Now you go out, you you know, you're you're got them all to the wall, throw hard for six innings. I, I, you know, I'm waiting, Jim. Now that you say that, I'm waiting for a quality start to be even reduced lower than six innings. Now, <laughs> I, when I when I look at the, I think the, uh, I don't know who the article was about, but they were saying such and such a pitcher had had X amount of quality starts in a row, and it, it, again, a quality start is uh, at least six innings pitched with three uh, runs given up. And uh, I don't know if there's other parts of it, but those are two main parts of it, obviously. And I'm thinking, geez, uh, that's that really over nine innings, if you give up three runs over six, that your ERA for nine would have to be, uh, you know, if you gave up, then based on that, you give up another run and a half over three. So your ERA for nine is 4.50. Four and a half. So that's not really what I would call quality no, uh, no. Uh, pitching. No, 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 it's not. Um, I just happened to glance here and see. Uh, uh, you, you'll be looking forward to the preseason, uh, the Bears preseason finale on uh, Thursday night because you're going to get to see David Fales and Shane Carden run the offense. Yeah, I have no problem with that. That should be entertaining. I have no problem with that. We, you know, we were in the conversation. I don't know. Clausen, Clausen's out with a concussion. So, if you uh, were in this conversation, or if this was the Mariano's boys conversation, but we got into the subject, which is one I like, of a hey, if this guy was drafted by this team instead of this team, what would what would things look like? And and my favorite is. If Joe Montana was drafted by the Bears or the Bucks or somebody like that, would would we be talking 
in reverential tones uh, about Joe Montana as a quarterback today or no? Well, you don't know what talent would surround him, and would they have brought anything, brought anybody better, would have he brought out the best in what he had. Now, keep in mind, Montana was a third-round draft pick? Third round, yeah. Yeah, so he was not exactly, you know, thought of. No, not highly thought of. Not highly thought of if he slipped down to the third round. I mean, he had his great game against the uh, in the Cotton Bowl, wasn't it? I think so. Yeah. Oh, you know. that was a game though that he I think they he didn't even start. He didn't start. Yeah. So I I think the thing about the What would the Bears what would the Bears have been like if Ed McCaskey would have won the to- the, the 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 coin toss after the 69 season and they would have taken Terry Bradshaw. Well, yeah, it's interesting when you actually sit down and look at people's careers, Jim. Terry Bradshaw is uh, obviously a Hall of Famer. I have a lot of respect for Terry Bradshaw. But his career with uh, the Steelers, at least was the, initially, tough, was shaky at It best. was a f- rough couple of years. So now, you know, throw Terry Bradshaw on the Bears, which was not the organization that the Steelers were becoming when Bradshaw first got there. And God knows, uh, you, you know, Terry Bradshaw might just be another wasted first-round draft choice yeah. based on that. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of draft choices, somebody's got an article here about fantasy football. Yeah. A round-by-round guide to stocking your team. A ra- <laughs> uh, do you, do you do fantasy football? I don't do any money leagues anymore. Oh, uh, you still do football? I, I still do it. In fact, it's kind of funny. Uh, for years and years, uh, the guys had started on the old an old scorehead board back in the pre days of I, I can't even remember how it was. We started a fantasy football league, and it's always nice and easy to play because nobody bothers anybody. <laughs> you don't have to. I go to trade off for four. <laughs> if there's if there's two trades a year, it's lucky. Okay. And it's a keeper league. You keep four players. Uh, you know, once in a while, I'll make the playoffs. Okay. Uh, and then there's another league. Actually, I I can't remember. I uh, another guy started something, and and it was again a, a scorehead thing. And um, I I think I made the playoffs. But I mean, it's a it's a you know sometimes it's well, fun. I played I played money leagues. And in fact, one year I played in a money league, uh, in two leagues that this one guy had. I I won the championship in one year. And I in in one league with that year, and I finished second in the other league. Let so I, I I made a lot of money that year. As as a guy who's at least familiar with fantasy, and I'm not. Uh, take a guy like Odell Beckham, who came, didn't even play an exhibition game last year, then had an outstanding season with the Giants. Now here's a guy who, if somebody took him, God knows why they would have taken him. But they would have uh, found gold in, in terms of their fantasy football. But here's a, here's another thing. He he had a great rookie year. Yeah. But I, I'm not saying it was lucky. But would you uh, then would you consider it a sure thing, or would you consider it a roll of the dice to take Odell Beckham this? Oh, year? people people will jump all over. They'll him. jump all over him. But in They'll your jump. opinion, what would you say? Would you say I wouldn't? I would not take him. I I would I would start to look at about the fifth or sixth pick. Okay. And see if he's still there. Okay. And 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 you know start start to fill in there, um, you know now this one obviously this guy's looking and saying well his first round pick would be Marshawn Lynch. Marshawn Lynch, but I'm not even sure about that one. I'm not you know I'm not even sure. Calvin Johnson is his second round. And what Calvin Johnson was he injured? Because I no. know he didn't play in the last exhibition game, mm, but I don't know why. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. You know the other. The, okay, the, now here here's a, here's a comment here on this one. Okay, it's hard to believe Megatron had been falling to the middle of the second round, but if he lands in your lap, raise your hands and scream hallelujah. Beckham Jr. and Gronkowski, if they somehow slide, are better options. i got to say this. I'm a Calvin Johnson fan. I think he's, what what I've seen of him, I think he's as outstanding a receiver as there is in the game. But here's the other thing. I think last year when we were talking Bears, we talked about Brandon Marshall, and one of the things that I had said about Brandon Marshall is he was at the 30 or 31-year-old age. 
where and your you talents start to slide. And I'm assuming I think Calvin Johnson is probably at that point too. So you don't know at what point these guys now. Now some guys are exceptional, mm-hmm. and they may go into their they may go to 32 or 33 and still have decent production. Mm-hmm. But I think that would be the exception to the rule. At some point, you're going to reach your peak and start to slide down. Sure. Sure. And you know, maybe Calvin Johnson is at that point. He I might don't know. be. He might be at this point. I had. I. I. Reason I. I looked at this and made me want to mention this, is uh, Drew Brees. This guy's saying fourth, good fourth round pick. I got a kick out of this. I saw an article the other day. Uh, Drew Brees. They're training at Tulane. Okay. Okay. He decided to walk home after practice. Uh oh. Two mile walk. Mm-hmm. He was. He was even carrying his equipment. Okay. Posing for pictures, chatting with people along the way. He got hungry along the way. So you know what he did? He called Jimmy Jets. <laughs> oh, okay. <All> right. <laughs> and, and they, and they, and they riding up on a bike as he's walking home. All right, I'll tell you. <laughs> hey, let me ask you something. I I used to like, uh, oh, geez. Now, Subway, I eat a little bit, but I used to eat at the, uh, oh, God, what's the other the other place? Quiznos. Quiznos I, I like yeah. Quiznos a yeah, lot. Yeah. What, do you like Jimmy John's? I, I do because they're quick. Um, we order in the office during the season a lot. Okay, so you're down to s- the block. from Right there. down the block. I, I swear to God, I, I asked the guy when he came in, I said, I looked at him and I said, I just hung up the phone. Where were you, in the damn basement? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like all of a sudden he walks in the door. <laughs> hey, Jim, you know what, I'm... Uh you know, we're almost done here. In fact, we're a little over. But as long as we're on the subject of food, two things I want to say. Fanny and Schmoes is is looking to go into a storefront around the uh, Milwaukee and Montrose area. I think I, you knew about I that. I knew about that one. And Steph is, uh, uh, I, I, uh, is uh, you know, she's going crazy because she's, she's well, uh, being bounced between the, the Steph, potential spot and the Steph uh, the is always people. that way. Uh, but the other thing I was going to say, uh, I stopped at Twins Drive-In, which is a local place, run, uh, obviously owned Twins. by a local guy, Jimmy Magulius. Twins. And Where Twins is? on uh, Harlem there, uh, just uh, s- north of... Uh, just north of Parkway Bank. Oh, okay. Okay, I was drawing and, a blank uh, on it. I was outstanding beef it. sandwich. I know there's a lot of other good uh, beef sandwiches in the area, but they had a beef there yesterday, and it was very good. Good. I'll have to give it a and, try. Uh, yeah, anybody who's to. out there, give it a try. I, I, I have to uh, um, I have to laugh. Somebody um, um, I noticed. Actually, uh, <laughs> it was kind of funny. My cousin's ex-wife went to the car show last weekend on Ogden Avenue in Berwyn and stopped at Novi's for beef, which was at Ogden and Oak Park Avenue. Okay. And uh, she says, oh, it's great. I said, I hope it's better because uh, it used to be my go-to place and the last time I went in there, it was yeah, not as good. Not as good. I said, I'm still, I'm still a Johnny's guy. Well, I, Jim, in all the years that Johnny's been there, the only thing I've ever had is the Italian lemonade, and the and that's fantastic. That is excellent. That and, is uh, fantastic. I'll never forget one year I went down with a bunch of people down on, uh, you know, in the uh, old Taylor Street neighborhood, and that one uh, there's one place down there that's noted for its Italian lemonade, and I had the Italian lemonade and it was fine, but uh, to me the best I've ever tasted is Johnny's. There, there is, um, and I and I called. To find out about it, and and I have not been to uh, Taste of Melrose for Taste of Melrose Park for a couple of years, but there was always a booth there that had Italian ice and Italian lemonade. It was one. Yeah, John is going. Yep, I know who they are. It was unbelievably good. It was so creamy. You swear to God, you mm. were you had gelato. Wow. wow. And we called and we called uh, the village. And asked where they were, and they said, "Oh no, that's a family." Oh, so they just make it for the. They make it for that, and there's somebody else there. She would make uh, steak teriyaki Hmm. and sell it there, and and take a booth there. But the oh my god, the Italian lemonade there was just unbelievably good. Hmm. Wow. Uh, John's going to get on the horn with the food coming. When we were with, uh, when I was with WJJG, we did several remote broadcasts yeah. at the uh, Melrose 
and uh, that person that you're talking about, that's why I know who you're talking about, they always used to make sure that we had plenty to drink in the broadcast booth. Oh, man. That was delicious. That was just yeah. unbelievable. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. That's right. I agree with you. We that. would make the rounds from there, and that would be the last stop before we left. We'd mm-hmm. get Italian lemonade there. Yeah, that was really, that was the, the true uh, Italian lemonade was from those people. And that yeah. was really great. Yep. Makes me want to go back to you know we're trying to decide this weekend. There's the Greek Fest up in up up in the northern suburbs near Ravinia. There's Taste of Polonia. There's uh, Taste of Melrose. Was oh, that this weekend? Labor Day weekend. Oh yeah, that's right. This is this is Labor Day weekend. Yeah. yeah. We so Labor we're Day trying weekend. to we're trying to decide what we're doing Friday night. Friday night we're going to see Sinatra Jr. All right at Ravinia. Is that right? Friday night, Frank Sinatra Jr. with um, with the Ravinia Festival Orchestra. I saw him a number of years ago, and it's a very entertain. He does a very entertaining right show. Right on, right on the other side of this door, right here. I have a tape of Joe Gentile and Frank Sinatra Jr. up at uh, Wrigley Field. Ah, uh huh. Yeah, well, uh, Frank uh, Frank Sinatra Jr. was uh, singing the Star Spangled Banner at this one particular game. And when Joe Gentile find out, because Joe Gentile and Frank Sinatra, they were very yeah, good yeah. friends. Yeah, yeah. And jo- Frank Sinatra was the patron saint of WJJG. Right, right, right. And when he found out that Frank, uh, that the kid was going to be up there, he called me up. He says, he, come on over and get me. He says, we're going to Wrigley Field. Yeah. And Oscar and I, we, we got in the car. We went over and picked him up and we took him there. And I shook the hands of Frank Sinatra Jr. He was, he was, he was a great, he, yeah. he said... I'm not going to do an impression of my father. That's right. He said, I just yeah. hope I can be a pleasing memory. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But he had great stories. Yep. Oh, he yeah. talked about after he did, and I'll say this, and you'll get mad at me and call the priest because when I said it, but I'm quoting from the, I'm quoting from the man. Okay. God, listen to this now. <laughs> I'm quoting from the man. He said, he, he finished Strangers in the Night. Mm-hmm. And he said, I have to tell you. He said, I have to tell you. He said, my father hated this song. It was his biggest hit. He said, and he absolutely hated the song. He said, that doobie doobie doo at the end, he did that to make fun of the song. Yeah. He said, in the last 12 years that my father toured, I was his conductor. Mm-hmm. He said, and down near the end, Dad was having a problem remembering the running order of the show. He was a problem remembering yeah. lyrics and remembering the running order. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He said, and there would always be a point in the show where he'd come back, to the podium where I was, lean down, take a drink of water, and lean into me and say, what's next? And I'd go, strangers. And he'd go, oi, that piece of crap. (laughs) 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 You know, I want to say this, and it's the the most complimentary way, uh, but when Dana... Uh, because you know when you're you're saying you're contemplating the different fests and you're going to see uh, Sinatra Jr. You were to see uh, Santana last weekend. Uh, you know, Dana found the right guy. I, obviously, she <laughs> likes these things as well. And uh, God bless because it's well, uh, you know I got That's a that's a at, good thing. Jim. Yeah, I got to tell you though. Um, um, you know, for somebody who's been going, uh, like me, who's been going to Ravinia on a regular basis for at least 20, 25 years, anywhere from three to three to seven or eight shows a year, it's reached the point where it's not worth the aggravation. What, Ravinia, you mean? Getting in and out of Ravinia. Now, the, you guys drive, right? Yeah. You take the train yeah, or anything? No, we, we drive. Hey, uh, Jim, and, and you have to, and, 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 and i got to be honest with you. You, if you're there for a, a 7.30 show, you got to be in the lot at 4 o'clock. They used to do a, a, a opera and concerts and out there. Oh, they still, the, the CSO is still uh, in residence there oh. in the summer. Okay, when I, when I was with another radio station, Bishop Shields, WFJL, we used to go there weekly at, uh, uh, at, at there to do remote broadcasting from there. And also, we used to go to the band show out there in Grand okay. Park. The old one, uh, the old one on Twelfth Street. Uh, Patrol. Yeah. Oh, oh. okay. The newer, yeah. the new yeah. one. Yeah. We used to do remote broadcasting out there. Mm-hmm. And of course, 
that music does not meet our kind of music that we want to listen to. So we set up all the equipment, and Joe Pelletier, God rest his soul, and I, we would sit there and listen to either the ball game or <laughs> some, something else. All we did was just watch the VU meter to make watch, sure that watch, watch the meter. Watch the meter. That didn't, o- didn't overmodulate. But yeah. Then, oh, that was some great, that was some music. My, that made my hair grow. Yeah. <laughs> no. I had to laugh. I had to laugh on, on uh, Sunday. We, we were one of the final cars into the parking lot on Sunday. And we, it, from the time, I mean, we left, we, we, we came up to Norwich because I had to pick up, a, uh, I wanted to get our, my cooler there because it had wheels. And we probably left Norwich around a little bit before 4 o'clock. Didn't get into the park until after 5, well after 5. Uh, one cousin wound up, they were sh- they were a little bit behind us. They wound up having to go to remote parking. When we were walking in, carrying the chairs, carrying that, I see I I'm over here. I'm overhearing a conversation between two ladies, obviously North Shore, and I hear one of them go, "You know, it's reached the point where it's just not worth the aggravation coming here." <laughs> hmm. And I'm at that point too. Uh. I'm at that point, and I said, maybe next year is going to be only one concert. Because they've reached the point where I'm telling you, a number of years ago, they started to put a limit on the number of lawn tickets they sold. I think that limit is bumping way up. Hmm. Because the lawn is oversold. You know. I have a question and a comment. The question is, if you took the train there, now, does that train yeah. special for, for it, the uh, problem, Ravinia? Yeah, there is, there is a Ravinia special from downtown, but the problem we'd have was we'd either have to drive downtown to get the Ravinia special, or if we took trains all the way, we'd have to take the train from uh, Downers Grove into Union Station, go over to Ogilvy, get the Ravinia special oh, up there. Oh, gosh. And... On a Sunday night coming back. You're not going to make the connection. Not going to make the connection. Now, my comment is, folks, in case any of you were wondering, John DeVito looks like he's not going to make the Bears' uh, 53-man roster. He's got a a brace on his knee. So I think he's probably either going to go on the pup list or maybe IR. I don't know, John. I don't know. I don't know. How's the knee? Not good, no? Not good. Not good? Okay. Yeah, okay. So we can count you out of the defensive backfield. So you're uh, not going to be you're not going to be in the backfield uh, this year. No. Okay, not in fact, not. in fact, the last couple of days I have kind of talking myself in going for surgery. Oh man, replacement. So, so I'm gonna I've I've got to make that decision soon, very soon, because well, it's this Sunday is the last Sunday we have outdoor mass up in Wisconsin, you're right? And of course, basketball is right around the corner of Ridgewood. And I want to get it done after after this Sunday and before basketball because setting up the equipment at Ridgewood it, it takes a lot of walking. Yeah, mm. yeah, and that takes and a lot. And if I'm going to, if it's going to take time to recuperate, I want to do it before the basketball season starts. Uh, now you're talking a replacement. I'm going to have to talk to Doctor Chekowitz about, about that because okay. uh, I, the, the last couple of days I've been in severe pain. Okay. Wow. And yeah. I, I mean that. I mean, yesterday I, I, I had actually, uh, I sat and I had tears in my eyes because I was in so much pain. Ow. Yeah. So the treatments that I was getting uh, did help, but um, unfortunately um, uh, the greenbacks ran out. The insurance and money care and all that ran out, and I haven't had treatments in the last, maybe uh, within the last three weeks or so. Wow. And, and I, I know it. You're feeling it. Yeah. 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 You're feeling luck. it. You're feeling it in, in high humidity and yeah. doesn't. Uh, mm-hmm. In yeah. fact, thank God that I've got James Rohde at at Ridgewood to help me. I got Oscar upstairs to help me, mm-hmm. and I just hired a kid up in Wisconsin, uh, uh, Ryan Pearson, that has uh, has been helping me up in Wisconsin. And okay. this kid is fantastic. I mean, for a 15 year old kid, I can't believe what a gentleman and what a what a very, very, very nice young man he Good is. Good for you. He yeah. won't let me do anything. Everything. Let me do it. Let me do it. Let me do it. Let me do it. You know. Good for you. And uh, okay, but good. All right, John. Well, we hope the be- hope for the best for you. Good luck with that. John. And um, we'll we'll try not to make you do wind sprints uh, during uh, during basketball season. Yeah. Um, we'll be happy if I'm I'm happy if I can just make it up the stairs. 
Well, we got an elevator now. Yes, I know. I, lo I love the elevator. I love the elevator. So once the new code is in place, Same code. I don't, well, like I remember. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. good, good. I'll remember that. <laughs> I'll remember that one. Okay. All right. That sounds good. All right. We've gone over again, but John says it was okay, so I guess that's fine. Let's wrap it up, and we'll get out of here for uh, whatever comes up next. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of fun, as always. Good conversation. S screwing around a little bit on here. We thank, to, we thank the doctor of the dials for putting up with us and getting us on and keeping everything moving. Uh, thanks to my partner, Rich, for... Just suddenly calming me down <laughs> and saying, yeah, we'll fake it like we usually do. Yeah. 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 Okay. We'll never worry about this. Stuff. Never worry about this. All right. Thanks for listening. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. We are taillights. You have been listening to Armchair Experts from the John Avetta Broadcast Center on Wednesday, September the 2nd. The Year of Our Lord 2015 on Jack FM 89.7 WRHS FM Norwich and the Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network with the WRHS sports announcers Jim Leon and Rich Massaro. This broadcast was directed by John DeVito and a special thanks to radio station manager Kevin Zeflick of WRHS-FM Norwich and the executive producer of Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network, Mr. John Chikondo. This broadcast was pre-recorded on Tuesday, September the 1st, the year 2015. Until next time, please be safe and thanks for listening. And this is Jack FM 89.7 WRHS FM Norwich, Illinois. Have a good day, everyone, and thanks for listening.